Welcome. It's 19th May, 2023. This is the GitLab plug Plugin Modernization Weekly Google Summer of Code status check. It's community bonding period. Uh, let's see, Harsh, we've got that checkbox item from, so from our past action items, I've still got to revise the project page and I did create the community page and upload the recordings, I believe. So I think that part we've got. All right, so Harsh, I think we're ready to talk about project plan review. And yeah, one more thing, the blog post is also completed, so. That oh, oh it is, oh, very good. Okay, so blog post is complete. Very good, thanks. All right, so ready to start the review of the project yep. plan? Okay, so here are the notes, and I'm going to make it bigger. How do I do the view thing? I'll just do it this way. There we go. Okay, Harsh, how would you like to take us through the, the discussion? Yeah, so related to the dependencies, the like uh, we'll add the GitLab for the dependencies. So I wanted to ask, how will I check the compatibility issues? Like I, uh, from the Maven repositories, I added the link for the dependencies, like what dependencies is GitLab for using? So how I, how am I going to test the compatibility thing? That's one of the issues that I had. So when, when you add this, when you add this, and if you retain STG. this, so the, during the transition period, I would think you would want both of them included yeah. and and then you'll change api by api or, yeah yeah so in terms that's, of that's the thing yeah you were now, saying something uh, so, well so so basil and i were discussing and one of his recommendations was for compatibility one of the best things you can do is use your debugger to yeah. actually watch the product execute, watch the plugin execute using the old code so that you become familiar with it, understand exactly what's happening inside that old code. And then as you implement one, one replacement of something, you can watch the execution of that same thing from a debugger and see, okay, does it behave the way I expected? Is it getting the expected return values? Is it doing the sending the expected data and getting it back did that answer your question or did you have something I more i already thought of doing that and i will be asking more questions related to the debugger thing i have specific problems using the debugger when i was trying to debug the webhook thing and the proxy settings thing so it's it's down there but uh, now let's don't talk about the debugger right now it's down so regarding the compatibility issue okay so I'll see through it. Like the idea that you told that having both at the time of migration, that's what I also thought. But uh, once I'll remove the REST easy, then the problem will start happening that GitLab 4J will be having compatibility, may have compatibility issues. So that's what I was talking about. But yeah, I think this answers my question. Okay. Ready to go yep. further down the page? Yep. So GitLab API implementation. So, uh, the REST easy used used client based things and the GitLab 4J is using API. So a lot of things has to be removed. Uh, I want to discuss on almost every class that has to be removed. Like uh, we don't need to build a client right now. Uh, you can directly use the GitLab API for that. And as the version three is depreciated, we'll be using version four and GitLab 4J already uses version four as its default uh, API. So other than that, the auto detecting GitLab client builder, that thing, I don't think so. It is required, and I would uh, actually yeah, that's right. want it's to not discuss. Required. It's not required, right? I had that's a right. question on that. Like, even if it if I'm getting it right, and GitLab API proxy will also be not required. But I want to discuss on the proxy thing more. So I'll be discussing in the connection and proxy settings section. So am I getting this thing right? That's what I, I think. I think you are, and uh, so. In addition to, so the existing code has a bunch of model classes to yep. represent yep. the various objects that, that are returned uh, that won't by the be Git. required because, because GitLab right. 4J already, already provides that. So I will be removing, the, uh, removing them, I think, 
Right. Except I'll check. I'll check if something has to be done with that. If some extra models are used, but I think almost all replacements are available in GitLab for G. That's right. So all the model objects can be removed, as well as the uh, client builder and related code, and the and the proxy code, and that's so that's all encapsulated in the GitLab for J library. It's gonna it's gonna be a nice code removal in the end of this. Yep. It's it's really a code cleanup more than a migration. So, so yeah, the, yeah, it's definitely a code cleanup. So um, in the connection and proxy setup, uh, there comes the real meat. So API token implementation, so, I don't think so. It will harsh. Be Bef yeah, before yeah, we yeah, go yeah. on from there, I I need to pause for a question on this one, and it's probably to, to both yep. you and Basel. So I've been terrified in the Git plugin of deleting any class for fear of somebody else depending on me. In this yep. case, with this one, it's it sounds like it's a reasonably safe choice. Is that because we think nobody else should have been using these classes as a published API? Yeah, I think that is a safe assumption. I mean, uh, if anyone is, is is using these classes in a pipeline job, for example, uh, it would be extremely unusual. Now, okay. I think there is probably at least one person out there who is doing it. Um, because I did once get a pull request to expand the model to add additional things to it. And I thought that was very strange because we're not, we weren't using that part of the uh, API in our own code. So why would someone want to expand the model to include it? So I think there's at least one person who is doing this, but it's it's, it's something that's clearly unsupported. Okay, so, so that's a case where if they were doing something particularly devious of looking inside the implementation and you and then calling it sorry we we don't promise to preserve that caliber of, of api compatibility yeah i mean and it, it's, yeah, it's just not reasonable for someone to rely on an implementation detail like that and if they if they do need some functionality like that they could make the same migration that we're making by okay. using the gitlab for j plugin or the gitlab for j library now, one of one of my worries in the Git plugin is that there are actual plugins that depend on the plugin. I just checked, and for the GitLab plugin, there's only one dependent plugin, and it's optional. It's an optional dependency. Therefore, they I think that means we're it's further indication we should be safe. Thanks, Harsh. Okay. So yeah, connection and proxy settings. So GitLab API. Uh token implementation won't require any change because it is getting it from Jenkins credential manager, which I don't think so it requires any change. Now, GitLab connection. So instead of getting the client, we are get, going to get the API and the proxy settings, which are which were implemented in the REST easy GitLab client builder. I think we will be implementing it in the GitLab connection. And can you, uh, can you scroll down a bit, Mark? Yep, so here are some questions. Like we have to discuss about the alternative constructors which were available in the GitLab connection. Like, uh, I don't know. Let me check um, what they were actually. Uh, GitLab connection, right? So there were three constructors, as I remember. Huh, yeah, I got them. One was using auto detecting GitLab client builder, which I don't think so will be required now. Um, second was client builder ID, which uh, extra, which was using client builder ID. And third one was using client builder itself. So we don't have those client builders and client builders ID right uh, because of the GitLab API. So are we going to remove those constructors also? That's one question. Yeah, I think you can, you can remove can anything that's not being called. Uh, and yeah, because if... I uh, I thought if it could create some problem if I remove those constructors, maybe programmatical issues may happen. That's why I was asking because right from I a compatibility not... point of view, nothing should be calling them from another place in the Jenkins project uh, yep. no, normally we do care a lot about uh compatibility issues like this in jenkins so it's good that you're thinking about it uh, but in the case of this gitlab plugin uh there really there really isn't any other consumer of this of this gitlab plugin uh you might you know there, if you're if you're thinking about compatibility issues like this the only place where it does matter is in uh code that could be called by a user. Uh, for, so for example, uh, if there are things like pipeline steps that have data bound constructors, those are things that could be called by a user who's writing a pipeline job. So uh, compatibility matters in that case. But in terms of some internal class that 
isn't exposed to a user, it doesn't matter. Yeah, thanks. that clears a lot of things for me. Yeah, so the next question that I wanted to ask was, how do I debug the proxy thing, which is currently implemented using the HTTP client engine because I can't really do that. I'm not able to do it. And it will be required because I need to um, really, uh, what what can I say? Imitate the same thing that has been that is being done using the REST easy when using GitLab or J proxy client configuration things. So what I've had, I some, thought that I've had I would... some success in the past with very like going on Docker Hub and looking for, you know, Docker, Docker images, images of uh, proxy servers. Um, yeah. Because I've I, I found a couple of good ones. I don't remember uh, now what what their names were, but there's like one that I found that allowed you to just define the uh, password and. Yeah, just run one Docker command to start up the proxy server with authentication. And, uh, you know, even though I wouldn't use that image in production without looking at it more closely, it was certainly good enough for uh, testing purposes. It, sa it saved me a lot of time uh, from having to learn how to set up a proxy server from scratch on my computer. Yeah, so I wrote some of them in my project proposal. So maybe you can see that also. I explained the proxy thing much more in detail in my project proposal. So maybe we can see that also. So um, like- Yeah, would you like me to open proposal. your project proposal? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was wanting. If you and now proposal, I need to find the link to that. Detailed. Yeah, I think the link was there in the meeting. Okay, so here's the, oh, here it is, project yeah. proposal. Yeah. Got it, okay. Oh, oh, wait okay. a sec. So <laughs> I'll just Come ask on, you, man. grant me access. Yeah. I was not expecting this. Oh, how do I grant them? So the, 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 the permission request from me to you should arrive in your email, I think. Yeah, I, I'm opening my email. I was really not expecting this. <laughs> this is bad. Oh, how do I uh, maybe I just clicked the wrong link. No, I don't see another. So, no, I don't have permission either. Well, or or the... harsh, we could have you share your screen. It doesn't have to be me sharing my screen. You could share your screen if you want to I show. I never something. really shared my screen. I don't know how to do that. Do you? <laughs> that... Um, that... <laughs> That's okay too. Then you're welcome to. You're certainly welcome to just grant me permission to look at it. Yeah. Wait, I'll just yeah. remove yeah. it from restricted to anyone with the link. That would be better. Yeah. And I am, yeah, I'll be yeah. sharing on the Gitter channel. Why I missed this shit? That's, Great. That's exactly. Okay, here we go. Okay. So I'm sharing it on the Gitter channel. GitLab plugin Gitter channel. Okay. Yep. And the so there was something Sorry about proxy here that you wanted to find. Uh, like in the challenges section, in the challenges section. Challenges yeah, section, on. okay, so challenges, here we go. Now, um, yeah, authenticated and unauthenticated proxy. So maybe we can read through this and maybe Bessel can tell us if, if it's right, because that's what I thought and that's what I'm thinking right now. I think this is correct, according to me at least. So like, uh, can you scroll a bit more down because I had those, I think it was called mid-temp proxy or something like that, which I wrote. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a bit up, a bit up. More, more, more. Yeah, to test these corner cases, like, yeah. I was planning to use the proxy client config class and to test this corner cases, like, yeah, mid-temp proxy, nginx proxy, and proxy right proxy, are these one of the things which you were saying or you have something else? As a Docker image. I don't remember the name of the ones that I used in the past, but they sound these okay. these sound reasonable at face value. So the uh, the the proxy settings come from Jenkins itself. You don't need yeah. to you don't need to detect whether or well, I mean, uh, there there's basically a, there's basically a a page in the Jenkins UI which is um, it's it's in like yeah, the, it's that. in it's actually Confusingly enough, it's the plugin advanced settings page. I think uh, we can set up the HTTP proxy and HTTP pro HTTPS HTTPS proxy through that. I yeah, think I saw Mark that. Mark knows you... where it is. It's that advanced settings page here, and this is where this is where uh, a Jenkins user can go in and configure 
the proxy by putting something into that server value. And then if they, uh, so, you know, if they, if, if that setting is, is not uh, null or empty, then uh, a proxy is being used. And then if they, if they have something specified in the username and password, uh, that, that would indicate that you need to authenticate. So those are the things that you should basically be checking these values. And if they're so, not, yeah, if they're so not empty, then them. you would pass them through to the HTTP client. Yeah, I think I'm right. So I'll be using this thing for my debugging. Then I'll be having much more clarity with the proxy thing because I need to debug this thing first for you know, doing anything. Yeah, so it. basically what you do is once you start that Docker image, you'd put inside of the server box, you know, localhost, and you'd put inside the port box, whatever port Docker has given you. Um, and then uh, for username and password, that would depend on, uh, you know, what you set it to when you start up the Docker image. Do you see? Yep, continue. Okay, so this this is the this is the primary proxy configuration page also for the git the gitlab plugin there's not a separate proxy configuration for the gitlab plugin as far as i understand it basel is that correct no this is the this is the primary proxy configuration page for jenkins for all of jenkins right. okay. it doesn't it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that it's in the plugin manager because it it really applies to everything that uh that Every, everything within Jenkins. So it could it yeah. could more properly be placed on the global configuration page. Right. Okay. So yeah. this is this is the one that's been been in the way of the Git plugin, for instance, on occasion gets is affected by this because this is really system wide. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. That that answers my question pretty well. So okay. like I have a lot more questions. Can you open the project plan? I don't think so. We'll I think Here I'm we right go. on this proxy thing. So yeah, what was it? Huh. Regarding the trust manager, like in the plugin, I saw that the trust manager was disabled. Like, so are we going to use some self-assigned or uh, because the it was written in the project uh, project idea that TLS certification will be required. So how am I going to set up the trust manager? Because I think GitLab plugin is using some X to build. I don't know, I don't really remember the name but it is overriding all those methods and it was not returning anything. Technically the manager is disabled. So we are using the trust manager, right? Yeah, for, uh, for, for configuring um, HTTP clients, um, there's, we, we usually wanna just use the default behavior, but some, sometimes our users, uh, sometimes our users complain about uh, the fact that like, you know, sometimes, sometimes our users have uh, target machines that don't have proper TLS certificates. So they usually want some kind of checkbox to be able to disable uh, TLS yep. verification. And it's not considered a good practice to do that. But uh, if you don't have a way to turn it off, then people with invalid configurations are going to complain that they can't use their non-conforming configuration. Um, so if the if there's not, if it's not, if TLS is not, I haven't looked at the current code, but ideally there, it would be enabled by default with some kind of checkbox to turn off TLS verification. And if that isn't yeah, already the case, it. then we could preserve the status quo or try to improve it if we have time. Yeah, I think I get it now. Okay, that's great. Yep, so this section is over. Uh, let's move to models in enum section. So the most fundamental thing here will be that uh, we are not parsing any JSON now. Jackson JSON is already available in the GitLab for J. We will be using events instead of uh, hooks and we will be getting data out of it and filling the, up the cause data using that. So almost all the models and hook models will also be removed. And we recently got a bug regarding the hook models also as, Jenny, as Chris told in the Gitter section, uh, Gitter channel. So yeah, that thing will also be solved using this models in enum. So I think, is this right? Any problems? No, I guess. So it is code, um, those support classes, those publisher classes and all, I wrote the code for everything like, so that you could check if 
things are working properly or not some utility classes that were also there one of things uh, one of the utility classes was commit status publisher i don't think so it will be required because um no that was a publisher class the, the class's name was let me check what was the class name the utility class was um so is it project update id you tell no Up, no no update commit status i think i didn't uh, write it in the project plan for some reason I'm... update commit status so i don't think so update commit status will be required because we can change the commit status using gitlab for j also so i think that will also be removed and related to this i wrote the code for my just migrating the rcc client to using the gitlab for j api that's nothing of a bummer so we can scroll down more Yeah, you can zoom in. Until unless the coding part is removed, I wrote a lot of code for that. Yeah, so cause data. I don't think so. Anything will be changed in the cause data. We can break the cause data for different events, but I don't think so. It will be required much as I saw that in the GitLab branch source plugin, as I remember. But I don't think so. It will be required. We uh, we will be using events instead of hooks, and that's the main crux of the web hook thing that we will that we will be implementing. And uh, related to the web hook thing. A lot of things has to be changed because we are not using hooks now. So webhook listener will be implemented, and uh, the trigger will be fired through it. The handlers will be uh, the handlers will be preserved because I don't think so. That it requires any change related to the trigger config chain. It is using the hook models which were used by REST Now will be uh, now we will be using the models which are available for GitLab for, uh, available by GitLab for J. So that is the whole crux, crux of thing. And the issue that I'm facing in webhook thing is that whenever I try to debug it, I am getting into Jenkins core classes, which I don't want to get into. So do you have any suggestions or tips for debugging the webhook thing? That's a problem for me. I don't really understand the question. I mean, uh, are you saying that when you, uh, when you use the debugger, you're missing stack frames and you're going too deep or something? Yeah, I, I'm going too deep, which I don't want to. That well, is the problem. I'm always getting into ACL classes or Scrum classes, which I don't want to. And I'm I'm doing step over. I'm not doing step in. So maybe I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, I'm not really too sure what you're asking, unfortunately. So so and harsh. So, Go ahead. Sorry. I'll ask it on the Gator channel then. It will be much clearer. I think it's not getting because um, I cannot really show you how uh, the debugging is going on. So it will be a much uh, longer process. So I think I'll ask on the GitHub channel about well, this or when I start writing the code. In 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 next week's session or in a future session, we could actually do a shared session and have you share your screen and and actually talk through a debugging session. So so yeah, there's there's no yeah. no shame in us looking together at what you're experiencing and seeing oh can we help understand what you're seeing and see is that what we expected you to see or was there some surprise in what you're seeing okay yeah that that would be great so yeah i think this is the complete migration and the bird's eye view and high level view that i have shared related to the timeline um i want to finish it faster of course and i broke it into small prs that i will, uh, that I will be making so this I don't think so. I need to discuss about this. So any questions that you guys have or any suggestions? So you said you've already written some of this code and you plan to clean it up and submit it gradually. Is that what you were just saying? Yep. By making small PR. Yeah. So how, how, much how much of it is how much of it is currently working then? I haven't really tried it. I just wrote the code for the project plan. I'll be trying to implement it in the uh, community bonding period itself. I see. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll I think we'll know how long it's going to take to do all of these things once we have some kind of working uh, test of an end to end. I mean, maybe not maybe not necessarily converting every single caller, but once once you get to the point where you can submit an, a request with GitLab for J and get a successful response from the server for at least one endpoint. Yeah. You know, once you get to that point, I think you'll have a clear yeah. understanding of how long yeah, these other things are going to take. 
but until you get to that point, it's, I don't think we could accurately estimate that. Yeah. So, uh, and that, that's actually correct. Go ahead, Harsh. No, you can go ahead. So, so I liked how Basel described it as end to end reaching from the GitLab plugin all the way into GitLab the server with GitLab for J feels like a very important important step and a good thing to do as soon as you reasonably can right so that hey we want that long that long thin thing that gets all the way into GitLab and that gets comes to the GitLab plugin as a pull request so that we can look at it together but that will make the pull request quite big that's why I asked the question on the Gitter channel also that can we have that big kind of pull request because so, you are saying me that yeah go ahead. No, uh, no, you're you're both correct. But uh, so, I think Mark is correct in the sense of wanting to see that code earlier rather than later, in order to, uh, uh, to uh, make sure that we correct any problems before it's too late. Uh, but uh, you're also correct that pull requests would be too large to to possibly review and merge. So the 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 compromise or the the way to to blend these two concerns is to make that a draft pull request, which we can start to look at. But then as you extract pieces of it, you can create yeah. separate non-draft pull requests for every piece as you're ready to merge it. And what that will mean is that your very large draft pull request will start shrinking over time as pieces of it get extracted and merged separately. So the goal is that draft pull request will eventually shrink to a size zero as all the pieces of it are individually uh, merged. But in the meantime, having it, having the large draft uh, is valuable for others to be able to collaborate and see what you're doing. Yep, that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of that. I like that very much. Okay, so yep. start with a start with, it's okay to go big on the initial draft, but we know we're not going to merge a draft pull request, but we'll, yep. we can use it for conversation, for discussion, for education on, on my part, on others, for debugging and exploration. I like that. That sounds really great. Yeah, that's, that's a really great idea. Thanks. So yeah, any questions, any, any other concerns that you guys have? Yeah, no, I, I wanted to go back and I know Mark mentioned this at the beginning, but I wanted to emphasize how valuable I think it is to step through the current logic in the debugger um, before you start uh, testing the migrated logic. Um, uh, whenever, because I've done a lot of migrations like this, and uh, it helps to be familiar with the old execution path before you start writing the new execution path. And in this case, most of the code in the old execution path is not R code in the GitLab plugin. It's a combination of R code and this library code. Uh, it's, you know, when, when, uh, when, when you're stepping through the existing execution in the debugger, you'll go from Jenkins GitLab plugin logic into uh, Jersey and Jackson, and then into Rest Easy, and then ev eventually into you know something very low level like you know, Socket API or something. Yeah. And just going through that whole path and becoming familiar with it is, uh, I think it's it's uh, going to be a valuable exercise. Um, you know, for example, um, you know one of the things, one of the things that one of the bugs that I fixed in the past has been. Um, when the when the when the server returns a bad uh, error, like a you know four o, what is it like? Uh, when the when the server returns an internal error, um, there's like a code path that displays the error to the user, and uh, uh, prints out the the prints out what the server provided as the uh, result. And I've had a bug in that. I've had a bug there in the past where. Um, uh, I was close. I was reading the response from the server and then closing the socket, and then Rest Easy was trying to do the same thing, finding the socket already closed, and then it, it was. It, 
ironically was losing the error message because it was displaying its own error rather than the one that I was trying to just so um, I mean that's the kind of thing where uh, you really have to be familiar with the internals in order to kind of replicate that behavior in the in the new version um, and uh, it gets the current code is pretty tricky because it uses Jackson and Jersey to kind of convert these models into JSON. Um, so, you, you know, you don't have to study that too closely, but studying the path of um, how that request gets sent to the server and how the, you know, how the response gets converted back and how errors get propagated, just being familiar with that um, is, is helpful knowledge to have before you go and write work on the rewritten migrated version um, so it probably you know spending spending a short amount i mean not not a huge amount of time but spending some amount of time just familiarizing yourself with and and don't be don't be afraid to step into rather than stepping over when you're looking at the old code in the debugger um you know it's stepping into jersey jackson rest easy just getting a bird's eye view of how this whole thing is working is 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 time well spent in my opinion you just answered my debugging question that was i was and that's what i was looking for because i was constantly getting into that stapler response and that uh, that crumb thing which i was not liking but i think that this is going to be frustrating to get into every single detail so yeah i'll try doing that thanks for that so any other queries questions well so one of the one of the suggestions i had seen previously was you may want to actually configure your own GitLab server so that you can, and so that you've got a local thing that you can use for experiments. Uh, don't be shy about exploring that. I think that kind of idea, sure, use use the get the public server as much as you reasonably can, but don't hesitate to familiarize yourself with GitLab itself because you're going to be interacting with it a lot. Yeah, it's very easy to do that. Too. You can you can uh, you can easily set up a local version of GitLab because they have a Docker image that is yeah, pretty yeah, convenient. I'm using that. Okay, good. Great. I have the production thing and the local testing thing both set up, so that's not much of an issue for me. Great. So, any that, more questions? No, no further questions from me, Basil or Chris. Any questions from either of you? Oh, this looks great. Um, I got some questions. <clears throat> Sorry, I got some questions about timeline. So, do we yeah. have like um, any draft for that? So, there's the timeline that had been listed. Is that what you were That's asking, Chris? Ideal thing. Yeah, because like we we just talked about a bunch of stuff, but I have no timelines for like what we what, what transpired. That's what I was asking. So, so is the question how how firm of a commitment is this current timeline? Is that what you're, are no, you are you trying to see how realistic this is? Yeah, and on top of that, like I would like yeah. to see how the time how how the how our like resources is going to be distributed across different tasks to see like how much we should include. I don't think it's realistic. I tried to create an ideal timeline because I was not able to get the realistic picture of this thing. As Basil actually said that we will have to implement first in a draft we are then only we can say that what time it will take. This is an ideal situation. This is not a realistic situation of the timeline that I can say for sure. Yeah, Things can get messy have, in between. Do we, do we have like a, like a confirmed list of items we must do and the worst like nice to have? I think the must do's are uh, uh, getting uh, getting the entire thing working with re with the GitLab API and then deleting the Rest Easy client. Right. And That's there's not really much of a uh, there's not really much more after that. I mean, if we have if we have extra time, I can think of other bugs to fix. But that isn't part of the core project. So the yeah. core project is really fairly. Uh, there's really only one core deliverable here okay yeah that, that that was my assumption as well is that the the we've we've achieved success if we successfully get rid of this dependency in the palm file eventually not not now not immediately right yeah. we want yeah, plenty yeah. of time to do it compatibly but if we compatibly remove this dependency that's a big victory 
Okay, I see. Yep. Yeah, and then as far as those dates are concerned, I think we'll we'll have a more realistic understanding of how long this will take once we once once we have a working end to end test with Rusty with GitLab for J, and that's so that that's why it's so important to get to that to get to that first draft or first end to end test because that'll inform us um, how long all this other stuff is going to take. Yeah. So, any other question? None from me. None from me. Either. All right, then let's. I think we can go ahead and call ourselves done for the day. We meet again. Um, or is this time a working, a workable time for you, Harsh? Is this a good time, yeah. or is? And Chris, is this an okay time for you? It is, but it's like it doesn't work for Freyam anymore. Oh, that's right. We oh, so yeah. Freyam Freyam is only available every other week at this time. Is that correct? No, not really. It's not available at all on Fridays. Oh, okay. I need so, to change it to like to accommodate him. So do we do we need a separate conversation in the chat to find a time that would work for Freyam? I don't remember when Freyam's times work. He doesn't. He he hasn't made any suggestions yet. We should ask. Okay, so let's let's do that in conversation in the chat channel to see if we can find a time. I I deeply appreciate that Basel was here today. I want to be sure that we find a time that works for him on the west coast of the United States, so west coast of North America, and I would love to have Freyam here as well. And Chris, we want to be sure you're here also. Okay. I'm also I'm also fine with asynchronous. Uh, huh asynchronous uh questions as well i mean uh you know especially if they especially if there are um debugging issues if they can be described in writing with a lot of detail then i could just reply to that whenever i get the message which could be you know different a different time so are you on the Gitter channel person yeah. i don't see you uh i don't check it regularly but i should be i mean i can i can join it and and try to uh Try to look for pings occasionally. Okay. Thanks for that. And one more thing that I would like to discuss is um, regarding the um, what? Yeah, in the GSOC office hours, Chris said to him. Um, what was that? I wrote somewhere. Yeah, develop uh, the mailing list. Yeah. So what? How are you planning to engage the community more in this project? Because like something on that sort was discussed in the GSOC office hours. Yeah. So Mark, uh, what's your opinion about this? So, so Chris, is your question there? Do you think that we need feedback from the community? I'm not sure where, where, where do you envision that this particular project would benefit from community? Is it early testing of prototypes? Maybe not at this stage. I'm thinking maybe later, like Harsh can send an email once once it's ready, and uh, we could have like some beta testing done on the GitLab plugin then. But not at this stage. Maybe later. Oh, terrifying thing. Okay. Good. Yeah, I'm afraid you might not you might not be able to find too many people who are willing to do that. In my experience, I've I've begged people to make to test changes to this plugin and gotten very few responses in the past so it doesn't hurt to ask but you might have to prepare yourself for the answer that you'll have to do the testing on your own yeah uh, that's been my universal experience with the git plugin is i i regularly ask oh could you please test this this unreleased thing and yes they'll all test it after i've released it and they'll test it and then they'll complain that I made a mistake by releasing <laughs> it before, you know, and that's just the nature of it, right? Yeah, I think I'll test it later for the project. So I'll be I'll be a tester. Right. And, and me too. So that's happy to happy to be involved and as part of code reviews, do testing then also. So that's that's no shame there, but that's us in the project team. Anything else Thanks harsh? For that. No, I don't have many questions, any questions left. So I hope you like the project plan. I, it looks great. Now, 
I did have, we've got this mentor checklist that I put on the list. I wanted to be sure we're okay. Oh, oh, we've got one open question still. Oh. How your time works out in terms of when you are on vacation, breaks, et cetera. So exams, is that already covered in your timeline? If so, then we can call that done. If not, we probably want to be sure that that we know when you're when you're not available, so we don't don't get surprised. So I, uh, I'm I will be busy in the coding phase one with my examination from July. I I think I wrote it somewhere less less available due to end semester examination. July. 5th, oh oh yes, so there it is, right there. You've done it. Very good. Okay, so we've got so, it. I, I wouldn't even say less available. So. Let's just declare unavailable. <laughs> Uh, unavailable, I don't think so. I will be um, doing some things because this is quite a frustrating project, to be honest. I have a lot of errors debugging this and I'll have to work pretty hard on this. Otherwise, this can get messy a lot. I don't want any regression. So, yeah. Okay, I have, I actually have something to add because like um, we got in community feedback. We already have some because like, if we go to uh, the Geta channel, Oh, can we go and take a yeah, look? Yeah, that at... bug you told. Yeah, because like the the uh the mic, like the the commenter, he actually got back to us saying like there might be a like a list. So uh like yeah. Hosh may want to follow up on this. So if we if we go to um yeah that reply. So last one. Last reply. Last reply. Yeah, so uh, you may yeah. want to like for, ask him like what kind of issues he has in mind. You may want to work on for GSOC. So this is like, this uh, is, yeah, because he's, he's that's, active. Yeah, that's hmm. not the primary concern. After that, after the migration is completed, then I will try to fix those bugs. I will ask him re related to the bugs, but uh, I think migration will be much more important than this because. Um, but uh, it, it's good to follow up, like uh, maybe. Over yeah, I will follow up. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I will. That's why I asked you on the Gitter channel as well. Okay. Sure. Great. Any other topics? Let's see. So I think we've addressed my concern on the checklist. It is, we understand it. We've got it. So I'm going to mark that one checked. Anything else? Nope. I don't think so. I'm not left with any questions now. All right, so okay. we will plan to meet again next week, and the time will for now be this time, unless we agree on a different time with Freyam, and we'll do that in conversation in chat. So I can start my code contributions now, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks, everyone. Recording should be uploaded within 24 hours. Sorry for the delay the last time. I'll be better. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.